this whole pandemic of the coronavirus and the stay at home uh, executive orders that have been passed by government entities have a unintended negative consequence. You know, many children go to school to get away from their dysfunctional household. And when you close down schools, you are essentially making those children stay in the very dysfunctional home that they're in. Not only that, but a huge number of students are on free and reduced lunch, meaning the, the, they go to school in the morning early to have a school breakfast, and then they have lunch at school. And that is probably, for many of those kids, the only meals that they'll have all day. So when you take away that resource, you take away their sustenance. The American family, just like any family or any around the world, uh, can be healthy, but a huge amount are dysfunctional because they've got moms and dads who have serious problems. And sometimes they're just single moms or single dads that have to work and they're just not there. So you'll have the abuse in the form of neglect where they're not being cared for, or you'll have abuse in the form of physical or sexual, or she said, domestic violence. And for those kids that are struggling, I just want to say, uh, you're loved. God sees you. He sees every tear that you cry. Uh, there's a great verse that I took comfort in growing up. It says, he collects your tears in a bottle. Isn't that an incredible thought? Not a tear falls down. So just know that you have a heavenly father, a God, a maker, a divine good that really does care about you. And he hears every prayer that you pray. And when you don't have someone to talk to, he's listening and he's always there. And you, and you say, well, that's not good enough right now because my dad is lost his job and now he's angry and he's drinking more than ever. And it's true. This whole pandemic forcing people at home has been a Petri dish for all the vices. For those who are clean and not uh, and sober for years, this is really testing them to maybe break that vow of sobriety. This is really going to be testing them. And some people have broken that vow and they have relapsed. And so here's what I say to kids who come up afterwards, uh, my assemblies, they come up after me. What do I do when I'm being physically beaten by my father? What do I do when I'm being screamed at and yelled at abusively by my parent? Well, of course, I would love to say, get out of there. But do you realize that that's just not possible for some of these kids? I would love to say, like I did one child who came up to me. He was a young man. He was a, probably a freshman in high school. And he says, my father beats me and my mother. I said, well, you and your mom need to go to one of these battered shelter places. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes. And he said, no, I, we need the money. My dad's our source of money. I said, well, they'll provide for you. They'll provide a house. Uh, uh, food. You don't have to stay in that environment. My mom will not leave, he says. She won't let him call the cops. And even when cops are called often by the children, the wife defends the husband. So we need to look at a different psychology. I like uh, Frankel from Man's Search for Meaning. He was in uh, being tortured in a Nazi concentration camp, and he uh, disciplined his mind to be able to find purpose for his pain. And that's essentially what I teach children. When they have no choice but to be faced with the reality of domestic violence and abuse, I say, you lay low. You stay out of your mom's way, out of your dad's way. You do not be a source of trouble in any way, shape, or form. Do not argue, do not. I clearly want you to call the cops. I want that person to be put in prison, but I understand if that is not going to happen for a hundred different reasons, then the best thing you can do is avoidance. That's practical. Now let's talk psychological. There is a disassociation that needs to be taken, that needs to take place. To be disassociated with someone means I don't identify with you or your behavior. Parents and children are so associated. They are so intertwined. Their identities are wrapped together. But in an abusive situation, what a child has to do, and little young ones can figure this out real quick. 
You have to disassociate. And you must become two people. What do I mean by that? When you're around the abuser, you have to take on a different persona. It's going to be hard for some of you who are listening to me right now. But this is the sad reality that children are in all over the world. In fact, I would call you, your name, something different. So if your name is, let's say, Stephen, when you're around the abuser, your name is now Steve. And you have to ask yourself, how does Steve act? Steve is quiet. Steve is calm. Steve doesn't cause problems. Steve does not share his opinion. Steve does not give himself permission to contribute in conversation or to argue or defend. Steve is just compliant and a non-source of conflict. Just no problems. But when you're Steven, your true self, who you really are, when you're around your friends, you're lively and bubbly and you're you're vivacious and you're opinionated and you're hilarious and you're taking risks. Part of the disassociation process for abuse victims is to be able to really become two people. You know where this happens the most? In 50-50 split divorce visitation scenarios. You know, just because school is closed doesn't mean the visitation rights have stopped. Those are still going on and kids are still now full time with the parent that they perhaps hate will become two people disassociate from that individual realize that the problem is not yours it's theirs and the third thing i would say the first being don't cause any problems the second become a different person when you're around them take on a new persona even change your name don't tell them to call you by that new name just tell yourself this is all internal work but the third thing is, is what Viktor Frankl from Man's Search for Meaning did. Envision in your mind purpose for this pain. That how could you someday use this pain or this exposure to this type of abuse for psychological growth in the future, for helping others? There's a, another verse in ancient scripture that says, May the God of comfort comfort you in your trials so that you may one day comfort others with the same comfort you receive from God. It's that same concept. Your pain can be leveraged into purpose. And when I was a child going through challenges, I envisioned myself actually as a psychologist, helping other children get through divorce situations. 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. I remember this girl, Katie, asked me, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'm like, I don't know, be an actor. She says, no, what's it like a legit role? And I said, well, you know what I always thought? I thought maybe a psychologist. You know, now I am a school psychologist. That's my master's degree level, a school psychology. And, and I am helping kids with the same tools that I once helped. So it's not just pie in the sky theory. This is truly how you help yourself. Number one, don't cause problems. Number two, disassociate yourself from the abuser by taking on a persona that even has a different name and you keep that internally. You don't externally share that, you keep that internally. And when you're around the abuser, you behave very strictly so that you are not to exasperate the abuse. And number three, awaken your imagination to envision the purpose to the pain that you have, that not one tear that falls from your eye will be wasted and not one moment of pain and sorrow will be forgotten, but it will be put to great use as you learn to be an incredible resource for others. That's my advice. Thank you for that question.